flip over this box. Yes. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program brought to you by the Estuary. I'm at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators at the Sea Lab and we are out uh, on the water this morning uh, with Becky Watson and um, Dr. Bill Walton Good morning. and Jacob Carpenter. Uh, who are going to talk to us about oyster aquaculture at this oyster farm and about the their bonus point program which is a partnership between the Auburn University Shellfish Lab and the Bryant Career Technical Center um, which is a vocational program that serves five high schools in Mobile County and so with that I am going to pass this over to Bill while Becky jumps in the water Water, and uh, we're going to talk about aquaculture and what they are doing out here. All right, thank you. Um, do I have a right here? All right. So my name is Bill Walton, and I'm with the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, but I'm also with the Auburn University School of Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences. And we thought we'd just start with what is aquaculture. And so I think everyone probably has a pretty good sense of what fisheries are. You know, we go out. Fisheries is the equivalent on water of going out and hunting you're hunting for fish. Uh, aquaculture has been going on for centuries, uh, thousands of years actually, but when we think of aquaculture, sometimes people think of uh, salmon pens, um, they think of recirculating systems in labs, but this is also aquaculture, uh, and this is actually shellfish farming. When I talk about aquaculture, we're really just taking living animals in the ocean or fresh water, and we're raising them under some type of control and that really, and that could really, sorry, and that really could be anything. Um, you know, that could be something in a tank, in a building, um, or in this case, you can see that we have these oysters under semi-controlled conditions. And, and you'll see that part of oyster farming is that we really, really work very much with the environment. If it rains a lot, as it has in the last couple of weeks, we don't control that, and that affects the oysters in the farm that we've got out here. So, can you all hear me? All right. A little bit better? All right. Fantastic. All right. Um, so what is shellfish farming? Which I would also, oyster farming is just a part of that. So some people grow clams, some people grow scallops, a lot of people grow oysters. Oysters uh, have actually been grown around the world. Um, there are several species that are grown, and we grow the native oyster here. It's called the eastern oyster, and that's what we raise. What do I mean by raising an oyster? Well, actually a lot of oyster aquaculture is really just doing what nature does except doing it where we maximize all the steps so the first step isn't here the first step is in what we call a hatchery and there we take regular oysters and we induce them to reproduce we call it spawning and we really don't all, the only trick we play on them is we try to get them when they're ready to reproduce and then we give them some signals that it's time. And if you're an oyster, one of the signals that it's time to reproduce is temperature. So the water temperature is one. Another cue might be food, a lot of food in the water. And a third cue, it turns out that if you're an oyster, and if you're going to reproduce, you're going to throw your gametes out into the water. And if that's what you do to make more of you, it's really important that when you do that, other oysters are doing that at the same time. The fancy term for that is called broadcast spawning. You're broadcasting your gametes out into the water. <laughs> By gametes, you mean eggs Gamete. and sperm. Eggs and sperm, yes, exactly. So we're trying to, and, and oysters have their male and female oysters. And so for those eggs and sperm to meet up in the water, it helps if when you're spawning that you're, the, you, the other oysters in the area are spawning at the same time. So the third clue other than temperature and food that we give to oysters the other the other clue that we give them is we'll sacrifice a couple of the male oysters and we'll take some of their sperm and we'll actually deactivate the sperm because we don't want them to fertilize anything yet we just want them to let other oysters know it's time to reproduce so we deactivate those and we will put a little bit of oyster sperm in each container with the other oysters and that lets the other oysters know or think that it's time to spawn, that apparently somebody else has spawned and so it's a spawning day. How do you deactivate them? 
So it actually, uh, the way we do it is we have a microwave and we put them in the microwave for very, very short periods of time because we're not trying to boil them. We're not trying to break them down. We just want those sperm to stop swimming because we want to control the fertilization. So it's just a chemical cue in the water really for the other oysters to know. So in the hatchery, when it's successful, we'll see an oyster start to spawn. And that should be more exciting than it sounds, but really it looks like rocks um, spitting out white fluid into the water. So the water gets a little cloudy. We'll separate those so that we know which ones are males and females. And that lets us, under controlled conditions, we can mix the eggs and sperm um, so that we get um, little fertilized eggs. And it's not unusual at a hatchery that we might have a day where we might have 100 million, 500 million fertilized eggs. So we can get lots and lots of babies. The reason for that is a female oyster in our area, she might produce, when she spawns, she might be putting out 5, 10 million eggs into the water. The reason we think they do that is because over time, if you're a broadcast spawner, if you're going to make more, you have to produce a lot. So in a hatchery, we can take all those and pretty much assure that they all get fertilized. And then um, there is a two-week period, and, and people who think of eating oysters, you never think of an oyster this way. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's warm enough yet that it would be happening in our natural waters here yet. Maybe. They might be spawning now. If they were, there'd be microscopic oysters swimming in the water. They're called larvae or villager larvae. And they're swimming for about two weeks. And under a microscope, it looks like a little clam. It's got two shells, but it doesn't look like an oyster that you and I eat. It's a little microscopic shellfish swimming in the water. And they'll swim for about two weeks. And in nature, they would then settle on to something. So again, in the hatchery, all we do is during those two weeks, we make sure they get all the food they need, the oxygen they need. We make sure they have the right temperature. So we're really maximizing survival. And then, when they're ready to attach to something, we make sure that they attach to what we want them to attach to. And that's basically little grains of sand um, that they each attach to. And, and when Becky pulls up some oysters, we'll get to see what single oysters look like. But it makes single oysters. And they go through metamorphosis. So that's just like uh, the tadpole becomes the frog. Um, they, that, that, those villager larvae that are swimming around out in the water are going to go through metamorphosis and they're going to glue onto something. Once the hatchery has those, and we call those seed, um, if you're a oyster, if you're a local and you think about oysters, you might call those spat. That's the newly settled oysters. Once they're settled, though, that's when we would take them and we would bring them out um, potentially to a farm like this. So, going back to what aquaculture is, that sounds pretty controlled, right? We're using a hatchery and we're we're changing the temperature and we're feeding them, and that is true. Once they get out here, we don't control a whole lot anymore. We're really working with the environment that Mother Nature gives us because we're not raising food for them anymore. We're not giving them oxygen and we're not controlling the temperature. We're going to put them in little mesh bags out here and we're going to let them feed on the microscopic plants in the water. They're going to get their oxygen out of the water and then they're going to be affected by the salinity and the temperature around them. So Becky, I don't know if you can grab some bags. We can bring up some oysters up here. That would be great to take a look at. So when I talk about growing oysters in bags, what, what does that mean? So these oysters were spawned last year. So these were microscopic oysters uh, last fall. And now uh, they've grown up. And these are actually our smaller line of these. Uh, Jacob Carpenter, who's a student with Bryant Career Tech, is going to open up the bag. Um, so we've got three lines. And this is our smallest line. So these oysters have been growing in the bag. Well, By line, you mean a genetic line? Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so the question, the, the point was, yes, a genetic line. This is a specific genetic line that we're growing. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that if you want, about how once you start farming something, you, of course, you want to make sure you're farming something that grows and, and survives pretty well. So, Jacob, if you can pick a few of those up, you can see these are what we call single oysters. So on a natural oyster reef, you get clumps of oysters. What we get from the hatchery are typically these singles. Now, there's, I see a double in there. I don't know, Jacob, if you can pull out that double as well, just to show them. So that's where oysters grew together. And typically from nature, they would grow into clumps. In fact, there's a wild set on top. So this is this was a hatchery oyster, and this is a wild oyster that uh, set out here on top of our oysters. But most of these are single oysters, and that's what we're trying to produce from the hatchery, because that's what the farmers is really trying to grow. But when, yeah. Of course. with the, um, with the, 
farm raised. So the and he's pointing out that the you know the wild oysters drift around in the water as larvae, um, and then they settle and they attach to something. Uh, what do they like to attach to? So one of their uh, you know uh, we. There's been a lot of presumably selective pressure. If you're a microscopic oyster looking for a home to live on, it turns out that oyster shell is one of the things that you prefer to attach to, and that's been shown. And so it's not surprising. If I took a shucking knife, I won't do it to this oyster. But this is a spat on top of, you can see this is an oyster here. This is another oyster here. These are two hatchery spawned oysters. And then this oyster is a wild oyster, a spat, that was floating around in the water here in Grand Bay. And when it decided to settle down and attach to something, it found this oyster and it glued on top of it. And then it's grown this way. And so you alter this process in the hatchery. At, he he um, described this process, but just to reiterate, they um, you supply them with um, um, hash. Is yeah. it shell hatch or is it we call it we call it uh, micro culch because when you put out oyster shell uh, we we call that culch and when, what we do is we take oyster shell and we grind it up uh, it's pretty crude we have ground it up with a coffee grinder before and we get a very specific size of oyster shell that is what this oyster in a hatchery it also attached to oyster shell just like that wild oyster mm -hmm. it's just that it did that back here and you can't see that anymore because it's so small so it's grown over it. But that is doing the same thing the wild oyster did. It's just that it attached to a really small piece of shell. And why why do they like to have the singles? I mean, why in the... Okay. So why does a farmer want a single? So yeah, that, that is a great question. So if you're going to farm an oyster, you, you'll, if you saw before, there's a lot of gear that you have to buy. There's the seed that you have to pay for. And it's a tremendous amount of work. We, we haven't really gotten into some of the work of oyster farming because you don't just put them out here and let them grow. You have to handle them. But... Um, if you're going to do all that work, you need to get a premium price for the oyster. And the highest price for oysters is going to the live half shell market. And so that's, you know, for anybody that likes oysters on the half raw, you know, you're looking for a beautiful oyster that's got a nice deep cup. And so you can see with these oysters, they're not all market size yet, but you can see that what we're looking for here is an oyster that's got a deep cup and a fairly, fairly broad bill so that when we open that up, we're looking for an oyster that is uh, super clean and nice and fat. And so what, that is really what the oyster farmer is looking to do, is really trying to take advantage of that. It would be unusual for a farmed oyster like this. We call this off bottom oyster farming because the oysters are not being raised on the bottom. They're being raised up off the bottom. Considering that investment, it would be very unusual for an oyster farmer of this style to end up taking their oysters and having them chucked into a, a pint. It's just that's not typically where you get them. That's usually from a, a bottom oyster, something that would be harvested off of a wild reef or a private bottom lease. So some interesting things in here. Is this, this is so little, but yep. is that, is that just... Dirt or is oh, was it moving before? I can't tell with that no, now. All right, so that I can't. I don't see. A, I'd have to look under a scope to be sure what that is. But let's take a look at some of the other things that we've got in here. Certainly, um, one of the things that you see, we, we work hard to not get fouling on our oysters. And when I say fouling, what does that mean? Well, I mean the stuff that grows on the oysters, and, and that includes this wild oyster. We don't really want wild oysters on top of our farmed oysters. It doesn't hurt them, but they will compete. They're, they're the same animal, so they're going to compete for food with them. And, and they, you can see this is a little bit harder to do as a uh, as a shucked product, uh, sorry, not as a shucked product, but serving this on the ice as a half shell oyster is a little bit harder than, say, this oyster. Um, so some of the other fouling that you can see, you can see a little bit of barnacle set along the edges here. Let me see if I can find another oyster with a little bit, a few more barnacles along the edge here. Um, again, that, you know, that if you're eating the oyster, you don't eat the shell. Um, but um, fouling can be a little bit of a problem uh, because um, the barnacles can actually sometimes die, even though the oysters are perfectly fine, and that won't smell that great. So uh, and the other thing is we do see that oyster farmers have a tremendous amount of fouling. Right now, we've, do, we've worked hard to control the fouling. So, how do we control the fouling? We do not put anti-fouling paint all over these. That is not what we do. Uh, we don't want to scrape all these oysters, and I really don't want to power wash all these oysters. So, what we try to do 
and this is kind of a common theme in, in a lot of oyster farming is we try to just do what nature does uh, we just try to um, take advantage of what nature gives us in this case we actually give the oysters a low tide and we give them a low tide that's maybe longer than they're used to and we make sure that they get that low tide once a week uh, and what we do is out here you can see some of these cages are empty right now so in the distance you can see these cages um, that are currently empty but if they had oysters in them, those oysters would be high and dry. That would be low tide. Whereas the oysters right here closer to the boat, in, the, in these cages where the you can't see the cage below the pontoons. Huh. Oh, Maybe right here. Yeah, I, Becky might be able to turn some up there. Um, in those cases, the oysters are not experiencing low tide. So they're growing, they're eating, they're doing all their things. But all the fouling organisms in the water are also thinking about making a home on those. So this is our, you know, you'd think that it's uh, fancier than this, but a lot of oyster farming is this. It's sort of getting in the water and uh, muscling stuff over. And there you can see those beautiful oysters, those brand new clean bags. And so we're trying to keep those bags as clean as possible so that the oysters can keep getting the food and oxygen they need. Because remember, since we're not feeding them, we're relying on the bay to feed them. And so we, to make sure that they get food, we need to make sure that those bags are clean and that the flow of water with the food and oxygen is coming to them. Uh, the other thing is uh, the air drying does help keep those shells clean and the oysters clean. That's the other thing we're trying to accomplish with that. So Bill, as you talk about the science behind the oysters and keeping them clean and, yeah. and all of this part of it, mm -hmm. I think it may be, Becky's going to talk a little bit about the program too, yes. but as she gets back into the boat, we can bring Jacob in. Yes, absolutely. He, he's actually learning from y'all all absolutely. of this through and the I, program. And what I'll do is just introduce Jacob. He's He's been a fantastic student. We've had a couple interns go through the program, and Jacob has just been fantastic. One of the reasons we've done this is, as you just saw, if you just saw Becky climb on that, oyster farming, yeah, we're relying on the food and oxygen and the water, but there's a lot of labor involved. This is heavy, heavy labor. There's no way around that. To grow more oysters, you can't run them through a machine. You need more people. And so what we found is as the industry has started to grow, one of the things that they've turned to us for is skilled labor, people that will are able to work a farm. And so I'll hand it over to Jacob here because Jacob is exactly the type of person we're trying to bring in younger people into the industry and make sure that the industry, some of the commercial farms, have a pool of people that are very capable to bring on to the farm. Oh, there you go. Jacob, what grade are you in? Uh, I'm in 12th. Yeah? 12th grade. And so when did you get involved with the uh, the Bonus Point Oyster Program? Uh, I was at the Bryant Center, and they came over talking about having a job on the water and then doing oysters and stuff like that. So I was like, well, I love being on the water. So I decided to give it a shot, and here I am now. Had you... Uh, been on the water a lot before that just just with recreationally or mm, not really no no man. so uh did you go out on boats with your family oh yeah yeah we go like every weekend and I used to work at a bait shop down the island uh -huh. so i did that for a couple months and so after you got involved with uh after you decided you wanted to sign up for the for the bonus point program um Tell us a little bit about what you do, or like kind of when you come out here, what do you typically do? Uh, normally I come out here around 2 o'clock and we come over here and we either store bags out, put new bags in there, or we flip the cages and then the last week we had to move cages from over there to over here and I come out here with Gibson and we do it. So I'll say too that uh, Jacob's the one who uh, who uh, piloted the boat out here. So uh, hold hold your mic up closer. Uh, and then how how long typically would you be out here in a day? Uh, all depends on the weather, basically. Because last weekend there was a big old storm coming, so we didn't stay out here that long. But normally from like two to five. And how many days a week, maybe? Depends on the I weather. Depends on the weather, but like say, you know, in an average, how many days a month might you get out here? Uh, I'll say like 
every day that we could. I worked worked last week, a uh, whole full week. So maybe two or three days a week. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, when I'm not on the water at the Bryant Center, they got cages for a flip farm. Mm -hmm. So I build the cages for that. Oh, yeah? yeah. So mm -hmm. you're building gear that's not even deployed yet. Is it similar to this? No, it's mm -hmm. totally different. Way place. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So is that an experimental design? Is it something that you've copied from a prototype? Uh, We had a prototype, and then I just had a copy of that and just made a... We have 1,400 to build. Is it made of similar material, but like a different shape? Uh, I think it's more hard plastic than this. And then it's got a uh, styrofoam on top. It says high tide and low tide. You just flip it. And so you, uh, Becky was telling me that you do your academic classes in the morning, mm -hmm. and then you you um, come out here in the afternoon several mm -hmm. times a week. Um, and then the, um, Bill was describing that it's kind of a, um, you know, kind of a training program, a vocational training program. Um, so, uh, do you have some career goals related to aquaculture? I don't know that question. <laughs> you're exploring? You're exploring different... Oh, uh, yeah. I'm definitely trying new stuff that I didn't think I would be doing. I wouldn't ever know I was going to do oysters, but I kind of like it. So when you're out here, how many people are typically out here with you? Uh, between two or five, mm -hmm. between that area. Mm -hmm. And, um... Can we jump in? Yeah. Cool. Um, Did you have anything you? else you wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask him a few more questions. So, Jacob, one of the goals of Bonus Point Oyster Internship through the Bryant Career Technical Center is for someone like you who's about to graduate to potentially work for a commercial oyster farm. So we are here at the Grand Bay Oyster Park, and here we can visibly see multiple functioning commercial oyster farms, many of which are very eager to have someone with Jacob's skill set and now expertise in oyster farming to join their full-time team. So it's exciting to think that someone like Jacob, who has grown up here, lives here, and loves working on the water, could get a full-time job working for commercial oyster farming. How long has this program been around? That is a very long question, but I'll give you the quick history. The first pilot of Bonus Point was through Alma Bryant High School about three years ago. It is sent, transferred over to Auburn University Shellfish Lab. And so we're in our third generation or iteration, but with COVID, last year, it kind of gives a bit of a hiccup. So moving into the fall semester, we're looking to recruit new interns from any of the five area high schools that are part of Bryant Career Technical Center. And that includes Baker, Davidson, BC Rain, Theodore, and Alba Bryant. So if you are a rising senior, meaning if you're going to be a senior next year, if you have transportation and if you have an interest of working on the water, we would love to meet you. How many students are currently part of the program? So Jacob is our solo intern now. We just had a few interns graduate that had been with us through the COVID year. And we're really eager to bring on more recruits, maybe two to four new interns for the fall. Thank you for holding my microphone. Uh, oh yeah. Do you enjoy it? Oh, yeah, I like it a lot. I will say he has a couple of friends that have asked about coming on board, which is very exciting. Both for him to have some peers that are just adults. <laughs> so what do you see as a part of the program? What do you see as the benefit? Not just so much the opportunity to work, but there's also another side of that too. For me, I have, in my own career path, I've worked retail and I've worked service industry, and those are grueling jobs for low pay. So just the opportunity to be part of the coastal community and continuing. Jacob's parents don't work on the water, but he's a fish on the water. He's super capital out here. So I really get excited at the thought of someone like Jacob or his peers being able to work on the water and not be stuck in maybe a career track that wouldn't get him very far. Right. Yeah. Oh, very much so. You would, you know, when we talk about workforce development, soft skills, people talk about soft skills. We got Jacob with excellent soft skills. 
he's well spoken, he shows up every day on time, he's always got a great attitude. So those are soft skills that anyone needs for any job, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. So to have that as a baseline for bonus point, and then we can add on interesting skill sets like working a farm, doing more of the <laughs> aggressive hands on labor, right? He got out of putting his wetsuit on today, you're welcome. But typically he is the one in the water flipping 70 pages while we're out here. So exciting to see the combination of growing the communication skills and helping you just, you're an awesome person to begin with. So making you a stronger person for the workforce is really exciting. And then for the grow here in the entire Gulf Coast. But here in Alabama, I feel like people have really embraced oyster aquaculture and made it a sustainable living or an add-on to other seafoods that people are working in. So you're inviting students to, uh, to get involved. Yes. How do, they, how do they get involved? How do they get in touch with you or through? Um... You can reach me. I am Becky Watson, oyster aquaculture education specialist at Auburn University Shellfish Lab. My email is my name, beckywazden at auburn.edu, and I can spell that out or we can put it on the Facebook chat. Sure. But another option would be to contact Zach Gibson. Coach Zach Gibson is his student supervisor at Bryant Career Technical Center. So again, if you're a rising senior or one of those five high schools, if you are able to do morning classes with your general education at your base high school, the afternoon program at BCTC is part of Bonus Points Internship. And when I say internship, take up. Let's talk money, baby. You get paid to be out here. Yeah. You get paid pretty well. Are you happy with your work? This is a paid internship, my friends. This is not free. We highly value your time. We highly value your skill sets. So just know if you are hired by Bonus Point, you are in fact an employee of Auburn University. And that alone is a really great resume builder and gets you opportunities to meet all kinds of interesting people, including scientists that work at the lab and other people who don't find it. Such a good stuff. Speaking about scientists, good fact to build. Yes. It's actually splitting up. Let's do, yeah. Perfect. Can you me those, uh, any clippers there? So, yeah, you know, absolutely. I love that, uh, actually, Jacob, do you want to just open up these two bags? industry works on labor. This is a very intensive industry, which, you know, in some ways drives some people crazy that we're that inefficient. You know, if you take a look over at one of these commercial farms, you'll see a crew working over there. It's a lot of people. Um, but, you know, my view is we live in a beautiful place, and the idea of having jobs that depend on working on the water is part of what makes where we live special. Um, so, I've been thrilled to see the industry grow. There have been a ton of challenges, but trying to get capable people like Jacob into the industry is really critical. But another critical part of it is making sure that people have good oysters to grow. So the first group that we showed you, that blue line, was just one line that we're growing. Becky's getting another tag on them there. But if we could dump out the orange ones first, which is the bag with less. So let's reiterate that that's a genetic line. Exactly. So in the hatchery, back when I talked about spawning, we just spawn different oysters for these, okay? get into that if you want, but you know, I don't want to bore people with the details, but they are essentially very different parents that we have for these. And we wanted to, what, what do you measure? Well, what does the farmer need to know? They need to know how fast the oysters grow, and it's kind of important how well they survive. So, Jacob's pointing out this orange line. When we started this experiment, we had the exact same number of oysters in these bags, and they were about the same size because they were spawned on about the same day. So if we can get out that yellow one poured out next to it, then we can go take a look at how different they look. But you'll see a couple things. And the first thing you might look at is how many there are. Because keep in mind, they started with the same number. And then what their average size is. And so that's important because a farmer wants to grow an oyster, but wants to reduce their risk by getting that to market as quickly as possible. And frankly, that lets you turn the next crop over. So if we go over here and take a look, Becky's over by, let's see, we start, the first batch that we looked at is on Becky's left hand there, and that was the blue line, and then, where did the parents come from? So, there are, uh, that depends on the parents, these, 
these are actually native wild Alabama oysters that we have done some selection on at Auburn University. So this is our, our standard line that we use. This is a line that the farmers have been using that is based out of some Louisiana genetics and it's using a, uh, a parent that produces, this is what we call, um, they, they don't spawn. These oysters don't spawn. And this has been sort of an industry standard and you can tell looking at these two, these look bigger than these. All right. I, don't, I, I haven't counted them yet so we'd have to get a count to be sure of that. But then because we had concerns about how these were surviving we went to this and these are also non-spawning oysters but their parents at least their fathers are from some uh, florida oysters that we had so these actually i should have mentioned these all share mothers um, all these oysters came out of a batch where they came all their the eggs came out of the same genetic pool but the fathers differed and so you can see uh this has gotten the attention of some of our oyster farmers because you can see that these oysters are pretty big and that there are a lot of them so this is the type of work that we try to do at the lab where we would help uh, improve the um, oysters that farmers have available to grow how did you select the different <laughs> so that's a good question you know that is a complicated process um, there's a couple ways to do that a lot of farmers like the idea of let's go to the bay let's go to Grand Bay and get the native oyster here and use that that's that's one way to do it Another way to, uh, but there are some issues with that actually if you're trying to breed a, a good oyster. I don't know anything really about the history of those oysters. I just know that they're alive in Grand Bay. All right? And then the other way to do it is an intentional breeding program where we take oysters with, and we put them out at different grow out sites and we challenge them. All right, so we've got we just put oysters out yesterday, and we've got some in Grand Bay here. We put some over in Mobile Bay. We are working with some farmers over in Florida. We put some oysters in Pensacola Bay, and that's part of a regional effort. And the idea is is that those oysters are all going to see different environments, and we're going to see how they survive, and then we'll use the survivors to help us pick out oysters that survive under better conditions. Can you talk about some of the different uh, environmental conditions sure. that challenge oysters? Sure. Well, for anybody that eats oysters, the ones, other than the size of the oyster, one of the things that you notice about oysters is the saltiness of it. And so you can imagine that the salinity of the water that you're in is one of the biggest environmental challenges that an oyster has. Here in Grand Bay, we are typical, I should start, full ocean is about 32 parts per thousand. Salt is we're so sensitive to salt, we don't measure it in parts per hundred, we measure it in parts per thousand. And 32 parts per thousand tastes super salty. That's full ocean salinity, all right? Typically in Grand Bay, we're running around, what do you think, Becky, 20, uh, eight, 15 to 25, somewhere in there. It's typically what we're running. Because we're, this um, uh, bay is adjacent Exactly. So we have a lot of fresh water coming down. Now, actually, this particular bay doesn't have a lot of fresh water coming in directly here. But because Mobile Bay has five rivers coming into it, that goes through Mississippi Sound, and we can get that mixing here along the shore. Um, with all the rain that we've had in the last several weeks, I think uh, it had dropped down to something like four or five parts per thousand. That's low enough that you can't even taste that salt in the water. And that is getting to a point that's starting to stress the oysters. All right. So you can imagine if you took oysters and you had a farm in the main part of Mobile Bay, where it's actually gone essentially fresh for a period of time, you, your oysters might be more stressed than, for example, even the oysters here in Grand Bay. So we're trying to, the, one of the biggest environmental factors we're trying to adapt to are these different salinity environments that they're in. You know, so that that's to be determined. We know the environments that oyster farmers are in. If you go across the Gulf of Mexico, farmers are growing in five to ten parts per thousand in some very fresh areas. And then we have other farmers that are growing at 32 to 35 parts per thousand, depending on where you are in the Gulf of Mexico. And to make it even worse, there are areas a little bit like this where it can swing between 25 parts per thousand and five parts per thousand. And from an animal's point of view, that's sort of the most stress is actually swinging from those different salinities is where you get a lot of... Uh,
things that go along with salinity. Yeah, and the, the you know, oyster drill actually, snail. I think we've got, I think I saw, now they're all in hiding now, but I think I saw a few blue crabs in here. I'm gonna, I don't have my gloves on, so I'm going to, all, right. all right, yeah. could you yeah. dig a couple out? Yep, they're so, in there. so, oh, yeah. there we go, there's a blue. Beautiful little blue crab. So, you know, when we farm um, off bottom like this, um, typically we'll get a few predators riding along in the baskets. But one of the one of the advantages of growing off bottom is we're kind of away from the predators. And we will get this blue crab, and we're just going to mm -hmm. put them back in the bay. That, that crab is not going to hurt these oysters at all. We're going to add it back to the bay. Hopefully it grows up and somebody, you know, it's a beautiful blue crab. Um, but... Um, we will see some predators, but we control a lot of predation in this. Um, the other thing that uh, you, there are some diseases. There's something called dermo. It's, it's, it's a disease that oysters get, and that doesn't affect people, but it likes salty water. So if we were trying to build a reef in, in Mobile Bay, I probably wouldn't try to build that reef down in the saltiest parts of the bay because we might get disease there. One of the lucky things about oyster farming is this oysters, even if it got dermo, which again wouldn't affect us, think of it like a spot, spots on apples, it affects the oyster but not us. Even if it had it, um, this oyster would get marketed and sold before it would likely die of, of that disease. And so oyster farming, because we're maximizing those things, we're maximizing how quickly this oyster grows and so it's typically we don't see a lot of problems from disease in what we farm. Um, knock on wood though, that, that can always change. Another thing to point out between these different strains, so Bill um, pointed out that these these two are strains that do not, they don't reproduce, right. they don't spawn, right? Um, which is, is something that you manipulate. Yes. But yep. the, the one that is local does. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, an interesting thing to note about that is that these farms may contribute to the local, the ones that are spawning, right. may contribute to the local oyster population. For sure. So one of the, when we think about oyster farms, um, so obviously we hope that individuals make money and provide jobs. That's great. But are, are there also environmental benefits? And one of the environmental benefits, if you're growing reproductive oysters, is that these oysters likely, before they're harvested, I wouldn't be at all surprised um, if we open some of these up, if they're actually what we would call ripe, that they're starting to get ready to spawn. And so when they spawn, they'll throw their eggs and sperm out into the water here, and that could contribute to the local population. Even, the, even these non-reproductive ones, though, have some benefits. They are all filtering out food out of the water. How is that environmental benefit? The, it is the equivalent of putting oysters out here is the equivalent of putting sheep out into an overgrown pasture. We have a lot of green in our water. We have a lot of green in our water because there's a lot of nutrients in the water. All right, It's warm, it's sunny, and we have a lot of nutrients coming downstream. That makes for perfect conditions for really green water. Green water is productive, but green if it's very green, it's hard for seagrass to grow on the bottom. By putting all these oysters out here that are all hungry, they're going to eat that green out of the water. So don't think of them as, they're not sopping up nitrogen, they're eating plants. They're eating the microscopic plants, but that's the same thing as grazing down an overgrown pasture, essentially. So the green is like a, it's like a storage for the nitrogen. Ex exactly. So, you know, you, if you grow, exactly, well, they, they are, they are uh, eating packaged nitrogen the same way that we eat nitrogen when we eat a tomato. Um, you know, so it's the same, same exact process. The other advantage is for anybody that likes to fish, if we were out on the bottom and you could see the bottom, there is not a lot of structure out here. So if you're a fish or a blue crab and you're out in parts of Grand Bay where there aren't farms, there's no place to hide. You, you are in a, it is essentially open area um, and anything can find you and prey on you. When you put oyster farms out here, we find that animals like this structure. So that you see blue crabs, that's because little blue crabs are completely vulnerable to other blue crabs eating them. And so by giving them all these little pockets and places to hide, we do tend to find that every time we pour out an oyster basket, we will find little blue crabs and we'll find that for most of the year. Um, when we're flipping the cages, we'll see little fish and shrimp go all over the place. And so for anybody that does like to fish, Today's a little windy. It's not unusual. If we come out to the oyster farm out here, that charter boats and recreational fishermen are dropping their lines all around the farm because we do tend to see a lot of fish around this structure. It's essentially created a little bit of an artificial reef effect here. And so what we hope is 
is that oyster farming is providing jobs and income for locals, but is also providing, even if you're not oyster farming, is even providing you some benefits environmentally by improving the bay. So these three lines, this is a mm -hmm. current research project? Yes. And so um, you hope to uh, uh, determine um, like like different survival rates and size and growth. Exactly. So if you were an oyster farmer and you were getting these oysters and it turns out that the data show that these oysters would grow and survive better, the next time you order seed from a hatchery, you're going to ask them for that yellow tag oyster, not that orange tag oyster. So that's exactly the sort of very like applied information we're trying to get. Okay, so you were talking about the, the ways to determine mm -hmm. which, you know, which one you might choose. But when I asked, I was kind of wondering how you selected those right. to investigate. Okay, how, like how do we even get these different lines? All right, so this has been, the, this is the standard line that had been developed for these spawnless oysters. So this is what we've been using. And the industry had been very happy with this. And then we actually got some reports that people were noticing that they were getting mortality sometimes in these oysters. And so as soon as we heard that, we started investigating, well, why is that? One possible reason is the genetics of those. And so what we did is the parents, the fathers of these were from Louisiana genetics. And so the, what we wanted to do is, all right, well, let's try something completely different. And so we generated in, uh, in the hatchery, we generated Florida parents for these that could produce these spawnless oysters. And so this was sort of our control. Most farmers aren't asking for these. You can see they're smaller. Um, so most farmers aren't asking for these, although that might change. We always recommend to farmers that they get a variety because you never know. You want to see how it performs on your site and you want to see how it works for you. This is only one study. It should be taken that way. Um, but this, th the rationale was let's mix up the genetics. We've looked at a bunch of other things. How often you dry your oysters. Um, we've looked at some of the handling techniques like tumbling, like how does that affect your survival? But we knew that genetics might be a big part of it, so that's how we varied this up. Were they uh, chosen from similar environments? No, so not necessarily. So in this case, we were just mixing it up based on, um, I think these Florida ones I'd have to look, but they may have been from a population around Apalachicola. So it was, it, part of it is, not, I can't say that it was, okay, we got this oyster that had survived at super high salinities. It was where we could find wild oysters that we could, that we could breed for this. So, um, I just want to point this out. Angela, um, if you want to uh, focus on these two different oysters, they look pretty different. So, um, in addition to the difference in the size, uh, if you look at the shell edge here, and this is something that you, have these been tumbled? So no, for this experiment, these have been pretty much left to their own devices. And so we're seeing a couple of things here. Some of this might be genetics, all right? But the other thing that's happening is, think like an oyster in a bag. This bag right here was much more crowded than this bag. Mm -hmm. So these oysters are in a little different environment in the bag than these. So we tried to control everything. We tried to put them out in the same bags at the same densities in the same water. We put them side by side, but then they survive at different rates. And so they, like these have a little more fouling on them because it's a more crowded bag. When we go to air dry these, these oysters, these don't dry as efficiently as these do. So you're seeing some of it is not just genetic. Some of it is still some of the cultural practices that we didn't mean to vary, but inadvertently vary when we do the experiment. Interesting. So. so can you talk about the advantage to um, tumbling them and sure. the, um, you know, the advantage to breaking off this right. growing Let me shell see. Let me try to see if we've got any real potato chips in here. So we call like a, if we get a really flat oyster that has no cup, we call those sort of potato chip oysters. They look a little bit like Pringles. And these are all, honestly, these are all pretty nicely cupped, but, um, so I can't find a lot that I would complain about here. This is a little bit flatter. So you can see this one didn't get as much of, as much of a cup. All right. Well, how do you, how do you affect that? Well, remember these oysters are filter feeders. They're eating the microscopic food in the water and they're in a crowded space. So for them to feed and get oxygen, the easiest thing, just like weeds like or plants that are crowded in your garden, they're going to go long. And so this oyster 
is growing this way, it's going to tend to add shell out. It's going to try to sort of grow out to the edges. That's perfectly fine, but it would tend to make a long, thin, flat oyster. And again, the farmer is trying to get something that's got a really nice deep cup so that when I open this up, it's a beautiful meat inside that's nice and plump. So if anybody has like shrubs that they trim at home, you know, they start to get long. If you trim this growth off of this way, it tends to force the oyster to, f to form a deeper cup. Instead of going long and skinny, it tends to fan this way and it tends to cup this way. And so we actually measure oyster fans and oyster cups and we have some ideas of different uh, things a farmer can do, like breaking off those edges by putting them through a tumbler that forces a deeper cup or forces a, a broader fan. Some of that actually is, um, again, is stocking density. And so some of this, one of the critical things that some of the advice that we give farmers is how many oysters do you put in a bag? So um, and, and the more crowded they get, the more that they tend to um, not have the ideal shape that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. That's um, interesting that there's the differences are so distinct. Yep. Here. Yeah. And, and again, like you know this is the type of thing that we would repeat and try to see if we get this again and if the next generation carries these traits as well so um, Becky is there anything that you would like to add as kind of a takeaway kind of a main message this is a very beautiful workspace my friends I highly encourage anyone that likes being outdoors doesn't mind getting a little bit muddy so for those students who might want to get involved, um, you would uh, take on new interns in August, September? Or? We would like to take a little bit of time to get hired, so applications are open with Bryant Career Tech Center, and again, the teacher there is Mr. Zap Gibson, he's our contact point there. Um, they also have a career development center at the Career Center, so if anyone wants to just call the career I apologize, I don't know the woman's name that runs the career center. Do you know by chance? It's okay. Um, reach out to Zach Gibson or myself. Again, my name's Becky, and I'm at the Shellfish Lab down on Dolphin Island. We would love to see um, some new interns starting with us mid-summer, if possible, yeah. but most definitely into the new school year, which is mid-August. So in the next few months. So do you have a uh, field season, or is it year-round? Excellent question. So. The oysters that you've seen today, we consider four seasons. It's a 12 month a year oyster. So there's always work to be done out on the farm. We are at the tail end of this current spring season, meaning these oysters were created at the hatchery on Dolphin Island last April. So it is their one year birthday. These oysters that you see here are one years old. And what does bonus point do with their <laughs> mature oysters that are ready for harvest? Bonus point is officially a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are able to harvest and sell our oysters to the half shell market, which helps support the nonprofit. So we we harvest our oysters about the size that Bill is digging around in, which is the larger oyster. We have some amazing local processors and distributors that support Bonus Point, both with giving us the audience to sell the oysters and the feedback we're getting from the public is really exciting. People are loving this oyster in the program. Jacob, do you like to eat oysters? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, do you do you get to sample some of the bonus point oysters? How do you like them? <laughs> so, if somebody who's watching wanted to try bonus point oysters, could they could they get their hands on some? Yes, it isn't as simple as just pulling them off the boat and bringing them to the shore. We do have some very strict regulations that we abide by. But again, I'd be happy to facilitate that for anyone that would be interested. <laughs> Maybe you need to uh, start a, an ancillary program, a culinary program with them. Oh, that would be fantastic. In my perfect world, I would love that. Um, and maybe that's part of the future of Bonus Point. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for uh, taking us out Thank here. you. Thank thanks you for fun. coming out here with us, everybody. And thanks for joining us. And uh, we hope you will join us for the next Boardwalk Talk. Thank you all.